I've been reading about past pandemics, and the author was noting how much hearsay determined people's behavior, the rumors that were passed around. And she said, at least now we have science. We know about germs, we know about viruses. We have some knowledge that can protect us. But at the moment, there's still a lot of things that science doesn't know. And we can't wait for science, because in some cases our lives are at stake. The lives of our loved ones are at stake, our survival is at stake. And so we fill in the blanks. We listen to information, hoping that it's not misinformation. But it's really hard to tell. Sometimes things are said by people with the greatest authority, and then a few days later they turn around and say the opposite. Or someone else debunks them, and then someone else debunks the debunkers. So in the midst of all this, we have to find some security. Something we depend on. And we have to be very careful to figure out what's worth preserving and what we have to may have, may have to let go. The mind, the state of the mind, is what we have to preserve. And that's something we can know directly, as long as we don't lie to ourselves. As John Cha said, one of the first things you learn as you watch the mind is how quickly it lies to itself. And so as you look around and realize you can't depend on a lot of the information coming in from outside, you don't know how you're going to filter that out. But when you look inside, you realize that there is something that can be done here. You can straighten out the mind. You can teach the mind how to talk truth to itself. And you have to start with something that's really certain. And John Fuhr noted how it's easy for the mind to start doubting everything. But he said, when you look at your breath, when it comes in, you know it's coming in. When it goes out, you know it's going out. And if you decide you want to doubt that, then there's no hope for you. So at the very least, hang on here. Watch the breath as it comes in, and you know you're with something that you can really know. Watch the breath as it goes out, you're with something you can really know. And if you don't want to go any further in the breath meditation, or you don't feel secure about going any further quite yet, well, just stay with this. But ask yourself if it's comfortable. Here again, you may have some doubts. So you can experiment. And think of the Buddha. How did he come to knowledge? How did he gain an awakening? When Mara kept telling him that it was impossible, or even after his awakening, Mara kept saying, no, you haven't awakened, you still have this, this, this. And there's nobody out there to confirm his awakening. He had to have trained himself to be reliable enough, and he had to train the mind to be circumspect and all around. So that his knowledge really was certain. And he did that by experimenting. Now with experiment, you don't just sit there and watch. You poke. You prod. Like with a breath. You can try longer breathing for a bit. And you can ask yourself, what different ways are there of lengthening the breath? The least obtrusive is to simply think longer breathing. See how the body responds. Then think shorter breathing. See how the body responds. And ask yourself which one you prefer right now. You're not making a value judgment forever. Simply, which feels best right now? And then you can try deep and shallow, heavy, light, fast, slow. Try focusing on different parts of the body.
Notice how you visualize the breath to yourself and ask yourself, is that visualization helpful? Can you think of others? There are plenty of ideas available. You can think of the body as a sponge. You can think of the body as a mist of atoms. You can think of breath channels going through the body. You can think of a cocoon of energy around the body. And ask yourself what works. Because all of these things are assumptions. But assumptions can be tested. Now, the assumptions we may have about the virus out there, it's hard to test a lot of them because we don't have the information. But you can test, you can experiment with your own breath and the mind and how they get along together. And if you teach them to get along together well, then you have something that's solid, something that's sure, something that's certain inside. Then this can become the basis for more sure knowledge. As you stay with the breath, you begin to watch the mind at the breath, first with the perceptions dealing with the breath, and also with the thoughts that come wandering through. Why is it when you've made up your mind you're going to stay with the breath? Something else comes in and immediately you go. When was the choice made? Sometimes it was made before you went, but then you hid it from yourself. So look for that. And as soon as you see the mind beginning to wander off, stop it, drop it. And it may be quiet for a while, and then it'll sneak out again. and see if you can catch it more and more quickly. That way you learn about the steps and the stages and how the mind fashions a thought, fashions first a, a fabrication that's hard to say whether it's a thought or a physical sensation. It's right in the boundary line between the two. But then there will come a point where the mind decides, okay, this is a physical sensation, and you deal with it that way. Other times it decides, this is a thought, and it's a thought about X. The mind is very opportunistic. As soon as it gets an excuse to think about something it's been wanting to think about, it'll find some fabrication, some place in the body, and say, this is it, and you go with it. Other times it's simply a matter of random memories coming up. You may decide you want to go with that as well, something you haven't thought about for a long time. Again, to go there, the mind has to create all kinds of things. It's in the creation of these fabrications, the elaboration, the embroidering of the fabrications, that we begin to lie to ourselves. So you drop those. As soon as you recognize them, you drop them. You're trying to look at things from the point of view of there being simply name and form, in other words, physical phenomena and mental phenomena in the present moment, without going into them and turning them to a state of becoming. After all, remember the Buddha's dilemma on the night of his awakening. He realized that any craving that led to becoming was going to lead to suffering. But the craving for non-becoming, in other words, to destroy a state of becoming that's already there, or to see it destroyed, that would lead to becoming too. What is becoming? It's taking on an identity in a world of experience. So there was this dilemma. His way out was to look at the fabrications that go into becoming before they form an identity, before they form a world. And he did that by looking at them simply as events name and form, mental events, physical events, right here in the present moment. And that way he was able to get past the dilemma. So it's good to practice that skill now, even though we haven't reached the point of being on the threshold of awakening the way the Buddha was on that night. But we can practice a skill, you know, learning how to see things that are happening in the body and the mind simply as that events right in here, right now. And that knowledge you can take as something you can rely on. The less the embroidery, the less the elaboration, the closer you are to the truth. 
and figure out how it is that the mind wants happiness. It sticks its intention into this machine, and out comes a little monster in a can. In other words, we want happiness. We think we got set some trains of thought in motion that will lead to happiness, but then they come out with, with pain, suffering, disappointment. What's there in the machine? This is something we have to figure out, and we figure it out by watching the steps as quickly and as carefully as we can. The breath provides us with an anchor to stay in the present moment so we can keep pulling ourselves back. It gives you your island of certainty in, in the midst of what outside is a sea of mistrust. And what for all too long has been a sea of mistrust in the mind itself. You want that island of certainty to grow. So nurture it, look after it. Stay as directly in touch with it as you can. As the Buddha said, the self is its own mainstay. Who else could your mainstay be? So make the mind reliable so it can be its own mainstay. And that way it won't be washed around by the waves in that sea of doubt. The information from outside comes, the information from outside goes. But as long as we have something solid and sure inside, the waves can wash and they wash away. But they can't erode that island of certainty inside.